Welcome, everyone, and happy Friday, wherever you might be. Um, <clears throat> I'm Abram Goldberg, Senior Vice President for uh, White Good Workforce Mobility, Global Client Services, based in Hong Kong, where I have lived for 20 years now. I am proud also to be able to lay claim to being a launch committee member for ATMA, the uh, Asia Talent Mobility Alliance. This is the second series, uh, second in our series of bite-sized country-specific or location-specific updates in the APAC region, um, covering key mobility-related uh, <clears throat> areas in each of these uh, locations. Um, we kicked off the series last week uh, with Meng Jai from Grable, Antonio Chan from Visa Care Global, and Tiffany Chow from Cargill, setting a somewhat high bar for us in their review and update for China. Today, our focus is Hong Kong, and um, still to come in our series will be uh, Singapore, Japan, India, and Taiwan. Our aim is to be holding these country-specific updates twice a year. The session is being recorded and will be sent to all participants or registrants um, after, after today's session. I am delighted to be joined today uh, by Lee Quain, Regional Director Asia for ECA International. Uh, ECA is, a, is known worldwide um, for their data provision, software services, consultancy, and training all designed to help companies manage their compensation and benefits effectively for international workers moving either cross-border or domestically anywhere in the world um, and for their clients to manage international assignments more effectively. Crucially for the ATMA initiative, uh, <clears throat> uh, ECA is one of our three foundation partners uh, along with uh, Relocation, Relocation Network Asia uh, and Grable. So a big vote of thanks to all three organizations for your significant support in providing the foundation necessary for ATMA's development. Uh, Lee is based in Hong Kong. Since assuming leadership for ECA's Asia operations in 2009, Lee has been heavily involved in the establishment of ECA as one of the most authoritative HR data and solutions providers in the Asia region. He's a regular speaker at international HR seminars and contributes to industry publications in the regions uh, regularly as well. In short, Lee is an established authority on all things global mobility related in the Asia region. And as I said, delighted to have you join us today, Lee. Thank you so much. Thanks Between Lee and myself, you. thank you. We will be covering noteworthy developments in the areas of immigration, housing, education, cost of living, and the global mobility landscape for Hong Kong over the next 35 minutes or so. Do feel free to ask questions via the Q&A feature uh, or chat feature um, in Zoom. We'll do our best to address these at the end of the presentation portion of today's session. So without further ado, let's dive in um, by taking a look at who is ATMA. Well, let's start with why we actually created ATMA. 40% uh, of uh, organizations uh, <clears throat> uh, sending or receiving locations for global mobility worldwide, anywhere on the globe today are actually located in Asia. More than 40% of organizations expect to increase workforce mobility in Asia. And yet until we got together to um, <clears throat> uh, launch this ATMA initiative, there was no professional trade association for the global mobility profession in the Asia region, and ATMA has been founded specifically to address and redress the situation. So uh, in short order um, <clears throat> about us, as you can see, um, our mission um, and our vision as uh, set out on, on this particular slide, um, we are non -for not for prof uh, non-profit organization dedicated to enhancing innovation and development of the talent mobility industry in Asia, our goal is nothing more and nothing less than to be the authority on talent mobility for governments and business in Asia, to provide support to mobility professionals and stakeholders, corporate or service provider throughout Asia, and to reflect and embrace, promote, and the distinctiveness of Asian countries, cultures, industries, individuals within talent mobility. The overall vision is simply, but crucially, to enhance the innovation and development of talent mobility throughout the Asia region. Who I hear you ask are the ATMA committee, launch, uh, launch committee and launch partners. You see this very good looking group of people uh, that are, are looking at right now. These are uh, the ATMA launch uh, committee partners. Um, 
each is uh, a seasoned global mobility professional uh, or a leader uh, representing uh, coming from a wide range of backgrounds, both server provider as well as corporate uh, across the across the Asia region. Um, each member brings um, a deep experience and representing the global mobility profession effectively and passionately over several over many years um, and uh, is helping drive the ATNA initiative. We're all very easy to find via the uh, various via various channels, not least LinkedIn, but um, I would encourage all participating today to um, dive into our ATNA website for further details and background um, on ATMA. Right, so Let's get to the substance of today's uh, proceedings, and we're going to kick off by taking a look at uh, immigration. Um, what's happening in immigration in Hong Kong recently? Uh, look, Hong Kong has been had a somewhat, as everyone is on this uh, participating today will be aware, Hong Kong has had somewhat of a torrid time of it over the last several years, starting with the protest movements around 2014, which gathered momentum until the imposition of the uh, national security law in 2020 brought the movement to a halt. Uh, in addition, there has been the no small matter of the COVID pandemic, which kicked off in early 2020, and which brought some of the most restrictive and prolonged pandemic measures to Hong Kong, culminating only in March of this year uh, with the lifting of the mask mandate, so literally just three months, three months back. Um, according to the South China Morning Post, Hong Kong has uh, lost in <clears throat> the between early 2019 and the end of 2022, has actually lost some 210,000 workers, uh, which is a massive number um, for a city of this, uh, of an economy of this size. Um, the Hong Kong government has recently launched the TTPS, the Top Talent Paths scheme, and other schemes looking to redress this. Uh, this is probably the most significant development um, on the immigration front in Hong Kong. Um, in recent times, the TTPS has been introduced for individuals We've been earning at least two and a half million Hong Kong dollars a year, which is approximately 320,000 US dollars annually for those, or those who have graduated from the world's top 100 universities and have at least three years of work experience. Um, since the introduction of the scheme, more than 33,000 TTPS visa applications have been approved um, that as of mid-April. Employers are also benefiting from a relaxation of provisions in the general employment policy scheme and the admission scheme for mainland talents and professionals. Now, these schemes are all looking to um, uh, include the elimination of labor market testing for certain occupations or high income earners and form part of a broader government strategy and a plan uh, to boost the economy. Uh, TTPS also interestingly has been extended not only to applicants, but to, de to dependents of successful and applicants. So to date, um, approximately 8,300 dependents have been granted visas along with the roughly 33,000 um, primary visa applicants um, processed to mid-April. TTPS is a unique um, arrangement in um, immigration terms for Hong Kong because it offers talented individuals and dependents the opportunity to work or establish a business in Hong Kong without the need to secure employment or provide a business plan beforehand. And the program does represent a major departure from the traditional uh, visa application process. Uh, and again, not least uh, in its extension of um, the uh, scheme uh, to dependents as well as primary applicants. Moving on to a review of what's going on in Hong Kong housing. Well, unsurprisingly, perhaps during the COVID period, the Hong Kong expatriate leasing market saw something of a 15 to 20% 20 uh, fall from the height of the market, especially for luxury rentals, or in a, <clears throat> which in oftentimes it is equivalent to the, ex the expatriate uh, rental market. The hardest hit areas being particularly the high end luxury uh, residential market areas of the, the peak and south side in Hong Kong. Um, the market sector below Hong Kong $60,000 per month, which is the lower end of the uh, expat property market range, representing rentals of around 7.7 thousand US dollars a month, has remained active, but asking rentals in this sector uh, have dropped by 10% uh, during the same period. There are some recovery signs post the lifting of the mask mandate in particular, in, as of early March, 2023. And those recovery signs include the increasing 
arrivals, uh, senior level arrivals, primarily from the financial services sector. And the leasing market in general seems to have stabilized with leading property company research departments suggesting that rents have actually finally found their bottom. Um, however, talking of bottom, the bottom line is that uh, there is still continuing ongoing longer term uncertainty. Um, Dwellworks Hong Kong, which is a leading uh, destination service provider in Hong Kong, does not foresee luxury market rental softening further uh, in the near term as local Hong Kong uh, tenants remain active in this market um, as they await a correction in the sales market. Um, at the same time, we're seeing uh, returning expats and inbound mainland Chinese tenants uh, potentially lifting demand for Hong Kong rentals later in the year. And the luxury apartment uh, rentals are expected to remain subdued, though, through the third quarter with a possibility in the final quarter of this year of a modest rally, which might equate to increases of up to 5%. In the corporate housing or temp living space in Hong Kong is somewhat of a different story. The lifting of the uh, travel restrictions, inbound, uh, inbound travel restrictions and the drive towards um, promoting Hong Kong or a return to normalcy in business and tourism um, in Hong Kong on the part of the Hong Kong government has led to a, a very dramatic increase um, in demand for uh, temp living options. Uh, so there's li limited capacity due to the increase in both relocation guests as well as business travel guests since the lifting of these restrictions. Um, and currently, just to give you an indication of the broad indicators for pricing in the corporate housing or temp living space for Hong Kong, uh, as of today, uh, guideline average uh, daily rates for one bed corporate housing and temp living options average around 323 US dollars per day. For two bed options, they would average around 524 US dollars per day. And for three bed options, that scoots right up to around 828 US dollars per day, um, <clears throat> which are quite pricey. That would cover, that covers off our immigration and, immigration and housing updates. I'm now going to turn it over to my good friend Lee to talk to us about education and cost of living. Thank you, Avram. Um, so before I talk about what we've seen in terms of education and costs um, immediate in the immediate recent period, it's probably worth giving a little bit of context here. So Hong Kong historically or traditionally is one of the locations in the region which tends to be blessed with a relatively wide choice uh, and availability of international schools. Now that may not translate to availability of international school places, but nonetheless, Hong Kong is one of the major cities in the region um, where there are historically a large number of international schools available. And that, Alongside the large number of expatriates who typically live and work in Hong Kong, creates a large amount of demand. Um, and Hong Kong has historically or typically had some of the relatively more expensive um, fees associated with international school places in the region. Now, it's not the most expensive location, but nonetheless, um, costs are up there. Um, however, over the course of the pandemic, we saw quite a uh, in Hong Kong, particularly between 2020 and 2022. And that was primarily a product of two factors. Um, on the one side, there was the issue associated with demand, um, both the impact of the end of the um, protests um, that we saw in 2019 to 2020, alongside the imposition of the national security law and the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as Avram pointed out, has fed through to a exodus um, somewhat in Hong Kong, both of expatriates and also talented or uh, senior level Hong Kong um, employees who would also have placed their um, children in international schools to a certain extent. 
Um, it also led to many mainland Chinese um, or high net worth mainland Chinese people who were residing in Hong Kong. Um, who had their children as well in international schools here in Hong Kong. So the combination of um, falls in demand for school places from these three constituent members um, typically led to either in some cases falls in the cost of tuition fees or in some cases freezes in the cost of tuition fees over the course of the period of 2020 and 2021. Um, however, um, in between 2022 and 2023, we've now seen um, tuition fees start to rise again. And based on our research, we've seen tuition fees go up by about 4% between the last year um, and this current academic year, which is a 2022 to 2023 period. And that's partly due to an increase in demand um, as people are returning back to Hong Kong in certain cases. Um, but it's also primarily due to the fact that schools are having to raise fees to, um, to deal with rising costs. Um, Hong Kong is typically not the most, ex sorry, not as attractive as a destination it is, as it was for um, expatriate teachers. And our experience indicates that schools are having to raise the salaries that they are offering to staff in order to encourage them to work here. So obviously that's having a knock on impact and that's led to a certain extent to the increase in tuition fees that we've seen in the course of last year. Um, so one other thing to be aware of as well is the fact that while tuition fees were quite stable during the pandemic and they've increased moderately in the course of the last academic year, um, companies and their expatriate employees also need to be mindful of the fact that increasingly over the course of recent years, we've seen more and more schools start to add additional fees. Um, this is because there's a certain degree of control over the cost of tuition fees. So that's influenced to a certain extent by the Hong Kong government. Um, who has to approve whether or not international schools can raise their fees and if so, by how much. And it's also reflected in the fact that the Hong Kong government to a certain extent also directly influences tuition fees associated with the um, main provider of school of um, tuition to international school children courtesy of the ESF. Um, and so because of that, many schools have introduced a lot more extra costs. Um, here we're talking about things such as um, debentures, um, which are essentially ways in which um, people can try and guarantee a place for their children. Um, so historically, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, um, the, the requirement to take out a debenture was limited to maybe one or two um, or even a handful of the very high profile international schools. Um, whereas now we see that from our from just kind of like looking at most of the schools that we cover, somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of these schools now um, require um, companies or their expatriate employees to take out damages or even pay higher enrollment fees in order to um, obviously get a place for their uh, for their children. So while we've seen a recovery in, or rather a recovery in the rate of increase in tuition fees in Hong Kong, um, a few things to, I suppose, put our mind at ease here in Hong Kong is the fact that while we've seen a 4% increase in tuition fees um, this academic year in comparison to 2021 to 2022, um, the rate of inflation in the region has actually been highest in Singapore. Um, that's primarily due to the fact that Singapore um, opened up its borders earlier than most locations in the region. There's been a large influx of people into Singapore. That's driven a huge increase in demand for school places. And that's also translated to an increase in education fees. And likewise, um, even though the rates of school fees are increasing in Hong Kong, um, they still remain relatively competitive in comparison to corresponding international schools in major cities such as Beijing, Shanghai and Guangzhou in mainland China. And also just to bear in mind that 
in spite of what we saw over the course of the last um, few years in terms of schools um, finding that they actually had more supply than demand for places, that's not something that we've seen wholesale throughout the territory. There are particular locations such as the more traditional expatriate areas, such as the Peak and Southside, um, which Avram was talking about education just now. Um, school places in key schools there um, still remain waitlisted. So something to be aware of for anybody who, are, who is planning to bring in executive talent over the course of the next few months. So okay. if we move on to cost of living now, in this case, what we're looking at, Avram, if you can, thank you very much. Um, so Hong Kong is or has traditionally or historically been classified as the most expensive location in Asia. And our research shows that's still the case. So at ECA, we undertake cost of living um, surveys at least twice per year in over 500 locations worldwide. Um, in high inflation locations, not saying that Hong Kong is one of them, um, but in high inflation locations, we'll increase our frequency and do surveys four times per year. Um, but based on the results of our most recent research, which was undertaken in March 2023, um, Hong Kong still does indeed remain the most expensive location in Asia. But historically, it's also been ranked as being the most expensive location globally. Um, and just to give you a bit of background regarding the methodology of coming up with this ranking, um, what we do is we look at the cost of day-to-day -day goods and services based on our cost of living basket of goods. And we also combine this with the cost of accommodation or rental accommodation in the cities that we research. So looking at that, taking those two factors into consideration, Hong Kong is historically the most expensive location worldwide. Um, however, while it remains Asia's most expensive location, it is now actually only the second most expensive location globally, um, losing its crown as being the most expensive location worldwide um, for the last four years. And it's lost that position to New York. And the main reason for that is because even though most locations worldwide have seen relatively high rates of inflation in comparison to previous years, um, and that it goes the same for Hong Kong, New York has had a significantly higher rate of inflation both for day-to-day -day goods and services. And while accommodation costs in certain cases, as Avron mentioned, have dropped at some areas of the rental market, um, in locations such as New York, um, we've seen a significant increase. Then at the same time, um, what we've seen in addition to Hong Kong is the fact that Singapore has now moved into the second most expensive location um, in the region. However, the gap between the two locations still remains relatively significant. And that's been due to the fact that although rental accommodation costs have increased significantly in Singapore, push it, that's been the main driver of Singapore's rise in, the, in our rankings. Accommodation costs are still significantly below where they are here in Hong Kong, and also the cost of day-to-day -day goods and services. Things such as milk and cheese, meat and fish, fruit and vegetables, meals out and so on, have actually increased at a faster rate in Hong Kong in comparison to Singapore. So inflation in Hong Kong has been quite significant in the last year, um, although it's not been as high as in locations such as Europe and North America. Um, and the causes of, that, of inflation that we've seen in Hong Kong have largely been those factors that I mentioned. The cost of food, for example, household goods and meals out. Now, the other factor that mean that keeps Hong Kong in its relatively high position has been the fact that Hong Kong maintains a peg of the Hong Kong dollar to the US dollar. And as the US dollar has strengthened against most major currencies over the course of the last few years, not just in the last year, but probably over the course of the last five to 10 years, that has essentially kept Hong Kong in a much higher position 
in comparison to other locations um, that we survey in the region. So for example, traditionally a Hong Kong would vie with Tokyo as being the most expensive location in the region. However, Tokyo has fallen in our rankings over the course of the last um, year. And that's been primarily due to the fact that the weakness of the Japanese yen against most major currencies, excellent for tourists, not so good if you're an employee in Tokyo being um, paid in Japanese yen and having to remit part of your salary back into US dollars or even Hong Kong dollars. So that's pretty much caused Tokyo to fall in our rankings. And we've also seen that in other locations in the region. Um, so Hong Kong maintaining that relatively high position, Singapore moving up in our rankings, for example, um, that's actually bucking a trend where we see a large number of Asian locations, locations in mainland China, for example, all falling in our rankings because of relatively lower rates of inflation compared to elsewhere globally and the fall in their currencies um, in comparison to other locations. So that's basically a summary of where we are in terms of cost of living. So Avram, back over to you. Thank you. Before I move on to close and we take the q and I've got a couple, I've got a couple of crystal ball gazing questions for you, Neat. My first okay. one, my first one would be, um, any thoughts on the near-term expectations for inflation in Hong Kong? Going to temper, level out? Is it possible that there could still be further bumps? So Hong Kong, inflation in, in Hong Kong is influenced by a couple of factors. Um, obviously, Hong Kong imports the vast majority of its goods and services. So part of it will be influenced by supply and demand um, of those goods and services. So historically, we typically see when there are supply issues in fresh produce from mainland China, that will feed through to inflation in Hong Kong. Um, so here we could be mindful of things such as the impact of African swine flu on of the availability of pork from mainland China. Um, Hong Kong is also affected by regular outbreaks of poultry related diseases that come that take place in China as well. So in fact, supply side issues can lead to inflation. Um, Hong Kong obviously doesn't just import the vast majority of its produce from mainland China, it also comes from elsewhere. So it does have alternatives when we have issues in terms of getting goods and services from China. But the cost of those goods and services will therefore be influenced by the price and therefore currency. So if we see, for example, exchange rates, so the value of the US dollar, for example, falling against other major currencies where Hong Kong is likely to import produce from, Japan, for example, Australia, elsewhere in, in Asia, then that would obviously have an impact on prices. So here we have to really look at currency and whether or not we think that there's any threats um, to the value or to the strength of the US dollar. And at the moment, I don't necessarily think that there will be. I think the US dollar, because of the strength of the US economy, because of the relatively high interest rates that we see in the US, that's likely to keep the Hong Kong dollar and the US dollar relatively strong. And so I think that inflation, it, like elsewhere in the re sorry elsewhere worldwide, where we're also seeing a decline of the relatively high rates of inflation that we saw in 2022, we're likely to see some form of tailing back or downwards movement in inflation rates. I think they will pre will probably still be relatively high in comparison to what we saw in 2021 and before, but I think the rate of inflation that we've seen in recent years or in the recent year, um, that will probably drop. But another factor to bear in mind is the recovery of the, Hong, of the Hong Kong economy. One of the major factors which influences inflation or local inflation in Hong Kong is also the cost of property. Anybody who's obviously buying goods and services, quite often they have to go to a store or a supermarket in order to buy those items. Those stores have to pay rents to landlords. And if we see a recovery in the commercial real estate sector, rents will go up 
and that will also feed through um, into costs as well. So these are these are all really factors, and it's very difficult to give an indication as to which factor will be stronger. Understood. Thank you. And then just before we move off, um, a lot of speculation recently. Um, just your just your high level thoughts, please, on any real possibility you think for. Uh, uncoupling of the US dollar and from the, uh, of the Hong Kong dollar from the US dollar, uh, that exchange rate peg anytime in the near future, or is that just idle speculation? I think that's idle speculation. Um, I think because of the size of the Hong Kong economy, it can't necessarily have a free floating exchange rate. So it would have to peg its exchange rate against um, one currency or even a basket of currencies. You're unlikely to see the Hong Kong dollar peg itself against the renminbi. Um, and that's because of the fact that the renminbi itself is a controlled currency. Um, we're very, and it's not really freely tradable. Hong Kong could instead adopt a policy of pegging itself against a basket of currencies, something that Singapore, for example, does on a semi-official basis. So it could decide to move away against pegging itself primarily against the US dollar. Um, however, I think one of Hong Kong's, I suppose, last remaining comparative advantages for many organizations um, versus the mainland, mainland China is the convertibility of its currency. Um, it's near um, certainty in terms of exchange rate against US dollar. And that acts as a magnet both for companies from mainland China looking to move overseas, as well as companies from overseas doing business both in the region in mainland China. So I don't necessarily think that there is going to be a removal or a dismantling of the peg anytime soon. Um, however, obviously in some cases, politics quite often trumps economics. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily want to say hand on my heart that it will definitely not be removed. Understood. Thank you very much. Hugely informative. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's move on to our last slide, um, <clears throat> general global mobility landscape. So coming back to the South China Mining Post again, um, and that statistic about Hong Kong having lost some 210,000 workers in the period of early 2019 to the end of 2022. And then as of June, 2021, the number of US companies with regional headquarters in Hong Kong had actually dropped by 10% to its lowest point since 2003. Counterbalanced to some extent, on the other hand, by the fact that China, China headquarter companies, um, and, uh, China companies with regional headquarters in Hong Kong had risen by 5% um, in the same period. Um, a survey by the Hong Kong American Chamber of Commerce uh, in April of this year, 40% uh, of respondents um, cited the impact of the national security law um, <clears throat> primarily through the departure of Hong Kong staff or feeling an impact of the national security primarily through the departure of Hong Kong staff or decisions over Hong Kong as a future corporate headquarters um, on the increase within their respective organizations. And then again, also April 2023, a poll of 196 companies conducted by the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce found that nearly three quarters of respondents were suffering from shortage of labor, uh, close to two thirds saying they've been facing this problem over the last three years and almost a quarter of saying, uh, companies saying that they um, have seen this as a, uh, experience as a long-term issue spanning beyond three years. So looking at those, not only those, but if you look at those key data points together over recent last several years, culminating in some significant business or company um, testing, uh, thought testing in, in, in recent times. What do you think are the, what, what, what are the near-term implications for Hong Kong, Lee, in terms of global mobility? Uh, what is this, William? What, is, what does the last couple of years all mean for global mobility generally in Hong Kong and going forward? I, I think um, that loss of workers that we've seen 
um, over the course of the last few years is significant. 210,000 workers may not really sound like much. However, when you think about the size of the Hong Kong population, Hong Kong's population is roughly 7 million, of which I would estimate probably somewhere between 40% are not engaged in the workforce. They're either obviously retired or they're below working age. And generally amongst the work working or amongst your workforce, most countries or locations typically have a labor force participation rate of around 60%. So if we take all of that into consideration, the workforce in Hong Kong is probably somewhere around 3 million or there, yeah, thereabouts. So the loss of 210,000 workers, that's almost a 10% loss of, of workforce over the course of the last few years. So for organizations who are committed to Hong Kong, looking to expand regional operations or even greater China operations, that therefore presents a concern to them. Where are they actually going to find staff from? Um, from a company perspective, that means like somewhere such as Singapore, we have to always look outside of our borders or not always, but we have to look commonly outside of our borders for talent. So organizations are going to have to look outside of Hong Kong to fill some of these talent gaps. Now, that obviously presents an opportunity for many organizations within the let's say, for example, within the global mobility space, um, because companies will be hoping to potentially bring more and more staff into, main, into Hong Kong. From where remains to be seen, um, but there is certainly going to be a need to import more talent. The other issue here, however, is whether or not Hong Kong is an attractive destination for talent to come and stay. So, Unlike other locations, particularly mainland China, where typically um, when people have been moved into mainland China from overseas, they've typically been there on a long-term assignment basis, worked there for about two or three years, then gone on elsewhere. Hong Kong, like Singapore, for example, um, has a much longer retention rate of expatriate talent. People come, maybe come on an assignment, decide to stay for longer, or they just permanently relocate here from the outset. So the recent concerns that we've had about Hong Kong situation, that may actually lead many international talents to either a question, whether or not they want to come to Hong Kong, or if they want to come to Hong Kong, to demand more in terms of compensation in order to relocate here. And for those who do come, they're more likely to consider this as a temporary destination. They'll come here for about two or three years once again, get some experience, and then maybe go on elsewhere rather than stay um, for a long term. And that's obviously of a concern for both organizations and the government, because if you've got this constant cycle of people coming in and out, um, then that has an impact on the ability to attract and both retain knowledge and skills to the benefit of the Hong Kong economy. Thank you, sir. You have expertly and incisively brought us to within five minutes of closing. Um, <clears throat> now it just remains for me to ask any of our participants have a question or questions they'd like to pose in the Q&A feature. Now is the time to do it. At the moment, there aren't any, which I'm, I'm going to interpret as the fact that we have addressed everybody's possible questions. I like to think so as well. Cover all bases. <laughs> <laughs> but I will give another 30 seconds for someone to think of a, of, a, of a question for us. Otherwise, we're going to give people back the gift of time. If there are no other questions, we are at 2.41 Hong Kong time, four minutes from closing. It just remains for me to put up this slide for those participating. Um, here are two QR codes for, for you. Um, you can use your phones, cameras to zap them now, or when you receive the, uh, this presentation by email, as you all will receive, um, you can uh, use these QR codes then. The one QR code will take you, set you up to uh, ongoing notifications 
from Atma about uh, news about Atma in general and any of our events. And the QR code on the right will very specifically uh, take you to the details of the next uh, webinar in our series of country specific updates, uh, which will be happening shortly. Um, so with no further questions at this point, three minutes to rem uh, closing, just remains for me to uh, thank Lee so much for uh, joining us today and sharing your knowledge and uh, expertise and to thank uh, Atma VS Asia Talent Mobility Alliance for uh, putting on uh, <clears throat> uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, happy weekend, everybody, and uh, goodbye.